Oh, gracious God, you are the author of creation, the Lord of every man. You created the world and everything in it. That includes us. And you demand from us our allegiance, our fealty, our worship. So I pray that in my task as minister of your word this evening, that you would help me to, to worship you as I preach your word. And that the brothers and the sisters here this evening, that their hearts might be willing to receive what your word has to say. And they would be glad for it, and they would rejoice in it as they seek to be more like our Savior, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. We're back again in 1 Thessalonians. We started last week, 1 Thessalonians 3, and we looked at verses 1 through to 5. And this week we're going to continue in verses 6 and to 10. So you can take your Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And as you get there, I wonder if you ever think about the highs and the lows of pastoral ministry. The highs and the lows of your pastor. Pastors are on call 24-7. Who fills the pulpit if they're sick? Who does the music? Pastors often have to deal with squabbles. Perhaps they find themselves mediating between different groups of people. Pastors have to attend business meetings and make decisions about things that they may not be qualified for. And when pastors have to make decisions about things, whether it's getting a plumber, or fixing the roof, or laying carpets, or more serious decisions like directing a certain ministry... They can find themselves being challenged on many fronts, criticized. The ministry cuts into family time and the kids grow up feeling like they were never dad's priority. And although we all confess to love our pastors, we need to all understand that the, the culture at large actually has a great distrust for your pastor. And perhaps even a disdain for him. Now don't get me wrong, pastors have a wonderful job, a wonderful role. I don't know personally a pastor who says they hate their job. I don't know one of them. But that doesn't minimize the difficulties that pastors face and often alone. And so in our text this evening in 1 Thessalonians 3, I want us I want you to see the heart of a pastor. I want you to understand what is true of most pastors that I know, so that you will understand the joys and the burdens of pastoral ministry, so that you can love your pastor and model, in turn, the heart of your pastor. And so we see the heart of our pastor in the Apostle Paul. No one knew the highs and the lows of ministry like the Apostle Paul. And we saw last week, didn't we, in verses 1 through to 5, how Paul was ripped away from them. And how he loved them, how he longed for them, his deep affections for them. His desire to go back to be with them. We saw last week from 2.17 that he was taken away. And in 2 verse 18, how Satan had hindered him as he longed to return to them. But even so, even as he longed to see the Thessalonians, who were Paul's glory, who were Paul's joy, who were Paul's crown of praise, Paul wanted desperately to know of their well-being. 
And so we saw last week, 1 through 5, that Paul was burdened for them. He wanted to know how their faith was holding up in the face of much affliction. He knew the hardships that they faced and he longed to be with them. Uh, Like a parent longs for his children. And we saw last week that he sacrificially sent his son Timothy to be with them. Why sacrificially? Because it was a great cost to Paul to send Timothy, to send his fellow brother, to send his son in the face uh, in the faith, to send the one who encourages him. Paul would need to be alone in pagan Athens, without his friends, without his brother, without his comforter, without his son in the faith. But as we saw last week, such was his love, such was his burden, his affection for the Thessalonians to see them, to strengthen and to encourage their faith, to fortify them against affliction. And so that to send Timothy was as if he was sending himself, a fellow brother and gospel worker, one who had the mind of Paul and the ministry of Christ in his own heart. And so in verse 4, Paul reminds them of the necessity of affliction. Paul didn't sell them a gospel of prosperity, of peace or an easy life. He sold them, as we saw last week, a gospel of affliction. He was clear from the very start. Paul's message was the same as Jesus. Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must daily take up his cross. And follow me. That was Paul's message. Paul was desperate to know if their faith in the midst of affliction was holding up. And in verse 5, we didn't cover it in huge detail last week, but it really is the burden that keeps your pastor up at night. This is what kept Paul up at night, it is what consumes his prayers. His fear, his anxiety, his worry was that Satan would have had some success in penetrating their faith. You see, friends, the real lows of pastoral ministry is when people walk away from the faith. When the labor of ministry is in vain. Think about when your labor has ever been in vain. One of my constant fears through seminary is when I've spent so much time, so much labor, so much work, so much research in one of my papers, getting all the quotes that I need, hours and hours of writing my paper, and the fear that I have is one day going to my computer and seeing that it's all gone. That everything that I've done, everything that I've worked on for weeks and weeks is just not there. It's happened once. (laughs) It's happened once. That's just for a grade. But for a pastor, the labor is in the souls of people. And it's heartbreaking to see someone they genuinely love turn their back on the gospel. This was Paul's ministry to them. Read chapter 2, verse 8 to 9 with me. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Because you had become very dear to us. Uh, For you recall, brethren, our labor and our hardship. How working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Their labor and their hardship in preaching the gospel. And Paul is concerned by the end of verse 5, that it was all in vain. 
Did they still have faith? Was the Word of God still living and active among them? He needed to know. And so we saw last week that Paul sent Timothy to get a report about their faith. And we saw two motivations, two two reasons, two guiding principles to encourage not only them, but you through affliction. That was Paul's reason in sending Timothy. If Timothy arrived and he was to find a living and active faith, Timothy then was to further fortify them and to strengthen them and to encourage them. That was the first motivation. The second motivation for encouragement was the reminder that, as we've said already, affliction was necessary and normative to the Christian life. And you ask, well, how is that an encouragement? It's an encouragement, friends, because it's not an accident. It was not because God had forgotten of their suffering. Rather, as we saw last week, it was destined. And it was destined for their good. For their growth in the Lord. And so today we pick up from last week. Paul gave the reason for why he sent Timothy. And now Timothy has returned. He's returned with the report of what was happening with this church. And so in 1 Thessalonians 3 verses 6 to 10, that's what we're going to cover this evening. You will see the heart of a pastor. You will see three marks that forms the heart of a pastor who loves his people so that you will love your pastor in return and that you would minister to him as you model his faith. You see, this is not just a sermon for your pastor, although it is, Anthony. It's also a message for you for two reasons. The first reason is this. It's good for you to know about the heart of your pastor. It's good for you to know what keeps him up at night. And listen, I haven't talked to Anthony about this, so what I say is just coming from my own personal experience. It's good for you to know that so that you can love him and care for him and his family. And the way you do that, second reason, is that you imitate him. This is what the Thessalonian church did. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 verses 6. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you, for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. And so friends, you need to share in the heart of your pastor, whether it's the joys, the the highs, or whether it's the lows. And so today, as we see the heart of the pastor, you will see those three marks so that you can model it as you care for one another. Let me read our text for us. And we'll start at verse 6, and we'll go through to verse 10. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, And that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now, we really live. If you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we, night and day, keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. And so our three marks this evening, friends. Number one, we're going to see in our text that a pastor cares for his people. A pastor cares for his people. Second, a pastor is encouraged by his people. And third, a pastor prays for his people. Well, let's begin with the first one. A pastor cares for his people. Timothy has now returned from his trip. Look again at verse 6. 
But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news. Stop there. Paul has been waiting with, with worry and concern for news to return about the Thessalonians. As we've seen, he sent Timothy previously. He's been anxiously waiting for his return to, to hear of some report about their faith. Are they still believing? Are they trusting in the Lord? Or have they succumbed to Satan's attacks upon their faith? Paul is like an anxious mother waiting outside the hospital room, waiting to see if her son is still alive. It's, it's that serious. But what does Timothy bring? Verse 6, what does he bring? He brings good news. Good news. Friends, that word is the same word we use for the gospel. It's the same word. The good news about Jesus Christ. That word is almost always used in reference to Jesus. In fact, I actually can't find another reference where it's not used outside of the gospel message other than here. The gospel. And so in our text, it does mean a report. He's simply bringing them a good report about their faith. But he uses this word. He could have used another word, but he uses gospel, good news. Why? To express the kind of news this is to Paul's heart. This is gospel news. It's not news that will save you, but it's news that will reinvigorate Paul. That's the kind of news it is. If Paul was drowning in the worries of his thoughts about the Thessalonians, this news is a lifesaver to him. And it's dragging him to shore, bringing him back out. And it once again highlights what we saw so clearly last week of Paul's affection for them. What is this news? Look at verse 6 again. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and of your love. Note the first one, of your faith. This is what Paul wanted to know more than anything. He wants to know about their faith. He wants to know about their spiritual life. Are they trusting God? Remember verse 5. This is what he sent Timothy to find out. To know about your faith. Lest somehow the tempter has tempted you. And our labor be in vain. He wants to know about their faith. Friends, the Christian, the Christian's faith is basic and central to the Christian's life. Faith speaks of your attitude to God. It is characteristic of your life as a Christian. You see, as a Christian, you can have great faith, you can have little faith, but you can't have no faith. You need faith. Had the Thessalonians fallen away? Were they like seed that had fallen upon rocky ground? That when persecution and affliction comes and when the sun beats down upon them, they grow up all excited and yet wither and fade away. Was that their faith? Had they actually died spiritually? This is what Paul wants to know. Has his labor among them been in vain? See, Paul cares about their spiritual health. The pastor cares about your faith. He cares about your faith. This is why the news that Timothy has brought is gospel life, because the news is ultimately, first and foremost, that the gospel is alive and well in their hearts. The good news is that they are indeed a people of faith. So friends, it's a good time to ask you, are you alive in the faith? Or are you spiritually dead? Is the hope of your salvation in Christ Jesus alone? Do you love Jesus more than your very life? Do you seek to live for him all the days of your life? Even, even if hell were to rain upon you. Are you committed to Christ Jesus? Have you sought him for the forgiveness of your sins? 
Do you believe what the Bible teaches about who Jesus is and and what He accomplished as the sinless Savior who who demonstrated a perfect life of obedience? Who, Who died the death that you deserved? Who took upon His shoulders the wrath of God? Who defeated the powers of sin and death and, and rose again to new life? And he's, who is seated at this moment at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for those whom the Father has given to Him? Is your name on Jesus' lips? Is your name written in the book of life? Friends, the offer of the gospel is for you now. Jesus died for sin. And God is now declaring to you, now is the time to repent, to leave your sin, and to follow Him. If Jesus were to return now, would He find you in the faith? Or would He find you in sinful rebellion? Would he see as a characteristic to your life a passion for him and desire for him and a love for him? Or will he have found faithlessness and disobedience? Will he have found a spiritual corpse? I pray that he will find faith. And that's what your pastor prays. His desire is for Jesus to find the individuals of this congregation to be people whose faith is in Jesus. What else does Timothy report? Good news of your faith and of your love. You see, if faith is the characteristic of their attitude to God, love is the characteristic of their attitude to one another. It is the application of their faith. The fruit of their faith in God is love. As their faith in Christ separates them out from the world, out from the kingdom of darkness, love unites them to one another and to Paul. Friends, if faith is central to the grounds of Christian confession, love is the proof of that confession. Jesus said to his disciples that the world would know that they belong to him, that they are his disciples. How? That you love one another. John 13, 35. And so Timothy had arrived in Thessalonica and he is met with this Christian distinctive. This is what he finds. It is so evident to Timothy that Paul will write later in chapter 4, verse 9, Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. It was their spiritually born inclination. This came naturally to them. It was a byproduct of their faith which just came so easy. Their love for each other was so tangibly evident. Their faith and their love had grown in Paul's absence. Yes, they lacked some knowledge, and Paul's going to help them with that in the next couple of chapters. But what they didn't lack, they didn't lack love. They didn't lack love. Faith and love, that was the first part of Timothy's report. But Timothy also brought news of their own affection towards Paul. Keep reading verse 6. And that you... Always remember us kindly, longing to see us just as we long to see you. We spent last week thinking of Paul's deep affection for them. And we see here the news that his affection was reciprocated. They always remembered Paul and they longed to see him. That was their hope. This was their affection, always, all the time, continuously, thinking kindly. These are the memories that are filled with affections. You see, previously Paul had wondered whether the the slanderous propaganda against him had turned their hearts away from him. But it hadn't. This 
good news report, this gospel report, reaffirms their friendship, their brotherhood in the faith. Their longing for one another. They had not written Paul off as some wandering preacher trying to make a quick buck off them. They knew the heart of their pastor. Paul had spent time with them. He had given of himself to them. He had loved them. And so they knew that with experience, Paul's deep love for them, and they longed for it all the more. Friends in the church, there must be a deep and mutual love between you and your pastor, and between your pastor and you. You must love him, and he must love you. And I know he does. I've been thinking, what's a good illustration of that? And I think perhaps one of the better scriptural illustrations is the illustration of marriage. Of a husband who loves his wife and a wife who is submitted to her husband. And friends, what happens is that Satan, as he tries to create a wedge between a marriage of a husband and a wife, Satan tries to create a wedge between you and your pastor. What are the things that causes your pastor's heart to break? The squabbles or the niggles, the criticisms, or the turning away in faith? Friends, the heart of a pastor is one that cares for his people. And you are to have that same heart in return for your pastor. As he cares for you, will you care for him? He has a great responsibility. He will give an account before the Lord Jesus for every single one of you. He will. Not not just his own life of faithfulness, but your life of faithfulness. And you say, I didn't ask that. Well, no, you didn't, but God did. God's going to ask him of that. And, And so wouldn't it be Wouldn't it be a joy for your pastor on that day before the throne of God where you are presented as a witness before the holy judge and you can say, my pastor loved me. My pastor cared for me. My pastor got me ready for this day. Friends, as your pastor cares for you, make his work a joy. Make his work a delight. The first mark of a pastor is that he cares for his people. And I just ask you to care for him in return. As we move on in our text, we see the second mark that the heart of a pastor is encouraged by his people. The heart of a pastor is encouraged by his people. Verse 7. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. The word comforted there is the, the same word that we looked at last week. It was one of Paul's purposes in sending Timothy to strengthen them and to encourage them. That's what we saw last week. That word encourage is the same word. And yes, that word can mean comfort, but as we saw last week, it had the idea of of getting someone ready for battle. It had the idea of uh, of standing firm. In the trials of affliction, it's not the kind of comfort comfort that's like a a pat on the back that that simply says it's going to be okay. It's the exhortation to stand firm. The Thessalonians are of great comfort, of great encouragement to Paul. As this news of their steadfast faith through affliction has reached Paul's ears, he himself is encouraged. He himself is comforted. 
to continue through his own trials of affliction. Paul himself continues to suffer for the sake of the gospel. Friends, the life of a pastor, if he's doing it well, is hard. It's easy. Sorry, it's not easy. That was the important, the, the not. That was it. Just checking you're awake. Good. So knowing that, make it your mission to encourage him. Don't be the congregant who is difficult. Don't be disagreeable about everything. Anytime decision needs to be made, don't be the one constantly criticizing. That's not to say he's above critique, far from it. But seek to make your pastor's life a joy. Take burdens away. Seek to be equipped for ministry. I've been debating whether I should say this this evening, but you can handle it. I think I'll say it. It's not right that I'm the one playing your worship music. I shouldn't be doing that. And it's not right that it's always on Jenny. She shouldn't always be doing that. Because what happens when just one person is sick? I guess we can't have church tonight. Those are the kinds of things that keep your pastor up at night. What are the ways that you can serve in this church? As you come together in fellowship to love one another. Your pastor's role is to equip you for the work of ministry. Your pastor's role is not to be the football player on the pitch. Your pastor's role is to be the coach. And you're to be the players on the pitch. Now, I don't mind playing for you. It's a great joy. So please don't don't hear that as me complaining. I love playing for you. But at the same time, I I work a full-time job. I study full-time. I have a wife and three kids preparing this message. And I have to play the music as well. That's a tough call. It's a tough call. And if I'm not doing it, then it's your pastor and his wife doing it. You could learn to play the guitar in six weeks. The the level that I play at, you could learn that in six weeks. I promise you, you can. I know four or five chords, that's it. I play those same four to five chords every week. You can do it. You can do it. And look, I'm not just talking about music. Here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about... What are the burdens on your pastor's heart that you can solve, that you can take away? That's what I'm asking. And maybe you think, I know, I just can't do the music. That's fine. My intention is not to put a burden on you. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to get you to ask that question. How is it that I can love my pastor and his family? That's it. That's it. This is why. Here's what your encouragement will do to your pastor. It will bring him life. Look at verse 8. For now we rarely live if you stand firm in the faith, if you stand firm in the Lord. See, this is life to Paul. Before this news, it was as if Paul felt the weight of the burden of their faith. He worried and he wondered whether Satan had got his talents in them, whether their faith was dead, and that personally affected Paul. You know this feeling. You know the feeling when you think of family members and friends who are not saved. It weighs you down. It's heavy upon you. For Paul, as he waited for Timothy to return, the surmounting question of their faithfulness bared down upon him. He felt dead inside. His enthusiasm had been weakened. His hope for them was on a knife edge. 
But at this news, this gospel news, this good news of their faith in Christ Jesus, Paul truly lives. To live is in the present tense. This is not a momentary blip of excitement, but a continual joy for Paul. It is an abiding reality. News of their faith has given him a new lease of life. Paul can go on. He can continue knowing their faith has remained steadfast. It's as if he was running a marathon and he's exhausted and he's tired and he's just about to give up and he gets around the corner and he sees his friends encouraging him. Go on! You can do it! And that gives him that second wind to continue. It reinvigorates him and he runs all the more to the finish line. He is encouraged by their faith. The heart of a pastor cares for his people, and he himself is cared for by his people as he sees their faith in action. It encourages him even more. So friends, you can encourage your pastor. You can give him that second wind in ministry. Paul goes on, how? By standing firm in the Lord. It's a conditional sentence, but the focus is on the assumed reality. They are standing firm, and that encourages Paul. And they should continue to stand firm. If they were to fall, that would be a great discouragement to Paul. It would hurt him gravely. So you want to bring your pastor joy? I know you do. Do you want to encourage him? The Apostle John wrote in his third letter, 3 John 3-4, to he writes, I rejoiced greatly when brothers came and bore witness to your truth, how you are walking in truth. I have no greater joy than this, to hear that my children are walking in the truth. See friends, you bring your pastor joy by walking in the truth. That will bless his socks. And he will know, friends, he will know that it wasn't his doing. He will know this was a work of the Lord in your life, and he will praise God for you. That's no small thing. Don't you want that from your pastor? Think about this. When when you call your pastor and your name comes up on his phone, What do you want the immediate reaction of the heart of your pastor to be? Do you want it to be, oh yeah, I love talking to you, it's great. Or do you want it to be, oh man. Right? That brings us to our third mark this evening. The third mark of the heart of the pastor is that he prays for his people. He prays for his people. Verse 9. For what can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God because of you? Paul is so grateful to God for the work his work among the Thessalonians. And so he gives credit to God. And he gives God thanks. Paul doesn't look at himself. He knows that he's not some great orator. He doesn't even praise the Thessalonians. He knows that they're all saved by grace. But Paul could so easily point to the sacrifices that he made, to his time among them, But he prays with a heart of thanksgiving and gratitude because he knows it was God. It was God all along. It was God's work among them. God had brought about their faith. God had saved them. God had kept them. It was God's work and God's work alone in them. God gets the glory and praise. And so he forms this rhetorical question that goes on in verse 10. Starting at verse 9, how can we thank God enough for the joy that you have brought us? How can we repay God? What do we have to give to God? It's a rhetorical question. 
There's nothing he can give but thanks and, and gratitude. Paul, his fellow co-workers in the gospel, Silas and Timothy, and even the Thessalonians, there is nothing they can give to God. They are all in God's debt. And notice the double use of joy and rejoice. It's, a, it's the same root word. It, it expresses just how deep Paul's gratitude is. It, it's a joy that washes over the distress and affliction that he felt in verse 7. And then he says, because of you. On your account, their faith is the reason for Paul's joy. And it is, Paul says, before God, in the presence of God. What kind of joy does Paul have? One that finds its fullness in the intimate relationship that Paul has with his God. And so verse 9 is a question that continues into verse 10. As we, night and day, keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Paul prays harder for them each and every day. His prayers are filled with thoughts of his Thessalonian children. He wants to be with them again so that he can teach them to fill up, to complete in them what is lacking in their faith. That's the heart of his prayer. That's the heart of a pastor, to be with his people and to teach his people. His prayer is for the joy of being able to see them once again, face to face, and to build up what is lacking. You see, the Thessalonians still had some weaknesses, Although they are the model church that we see in chapter 1, although their attitude to God was steadfast, yet they had questions, they had worries, they had concerns. Timothy had brought back news to Paul of, of some of their fears. And in chapter 4, Paul's going to go on to address their fear about those who had already died. That, that somehow those who had died in the faith since Paul had left them, might miss out on the coming of the Lord. That was their concern. And so their hearts ached for their fallen brethren. But Paul will reassure them in chapter 4, verse 16, that the dead in Christ will rise first when Jesus comes back. And in chapter 5, he corrects their thinking about the uncertainty of when Jesus would return. And his encouragement to them is to live in such a way that when the Lord does return, in his timing, he will find them ready. He will find them ready. Paul had to leave them suddenly. There was still so much he wanted to teach them that he needed to teach them. There were gaps in their understanding. And friends, this is the heart of the pastor. To be with his people. And to teach his people. Anthony, you were only 45 minutes this morning. What's going on? <laughs> but I want you to know that Paul isn't attacking them here. He's not attacking them. You see, Paul was with them anywhere from three weeks to three months. That's it. From pagans to new believing Christians. And then he's gone. How long have you been a Christian? How long have you attended this church? How long have you been taught by your pastor? How many sermons have you heard? How many Bible studies have you been to? How many personal corrections and rebukes and exhortations have you received from Scripture over your Christian life? And have you arrived yet? Are you still not lacking in faith? We all are. We all are. And so that's why, friends, God has given us the, the church with pastors to teach us faithfully from God's Word. To complete in us what is lacking. To build us up. To equip us for works of service. So that your pastor may present you before the throne of Jesus and where he may hear about you on that day. Well done. Good and faithful servant. 
That's what your pastor wants to hear said about you. That's the heart of your pastor. So friends, you and I are lacking. We are in need of completing what is lacking. We need more love, don't we? We need more faith. We need more zeal, more joy. We need more of God. We need to know Christ and the riches of His grace deeper. We need the counselor and His wisdom. We need to know more scriptures in our hearts and our minds. We need not only know the scriptures, but we need to believe them and to obey them and to cherish them. We need to complete what is lacking. We need to press on for more. And so, friends, God has given us our pastors to help us in this task. These are the marks of the pastor. Let's just recap as we come to a close. The first mark is that your pastor cares for you. As Timothy brought good news of their faith, you must strive to be a faithful Christian for your pastor. As he brought good news of their love, you must strive to love one another and your pastor. As he brought good news of their kind thoughts, you must think kindly of a pastor, even if you think he's being difficult. Be a joy to him. As Timothy brought good news of their longing to be with Paul, you must make every effort to be here, among the fellowship, with your pastor, under God's word together. Encourage one another to make your Christian gatherings a priority. You are believers first, Christians first. You are characterized by your faith to God and your love to one another. The second mark is that your pastor is encouraged by your faith. Your pastor is not perfect. Your pastor suffers with many of the same things that you suffer with. As Paul suffered in distress and affliction, so too does your pastor. In the same way that he encourages you with the word of God, be an encouragement to him with the word of God. And make sure that you are standing firm in the faith. He has given his life to the cause of the gospel. And although there are many joys and there are, there are unique challenges that weigh on him. And so strive to be a joy and a delight and care for him and care for his family. And the third mark is that your pastor prays for you. When you stand firm in the faith, He gives thanks to God for you, for the joy that you give Him. He loves being with you. He loves seeing you and spending time with you. And His prayers are for you each week, daily, and as a congregation, and as individuals. When you hurt, He hurts. When you rejoice, He rejoices. And in all that, he is praying for your increased faith in the Lord. He prays as he prepares sermons. He prays as he preaches. And so make it your habit in return to pray for him and for his wife and for his family and for his God-given role among you as your pastor. And make your desire to be an answer to his prayers for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this evening. Thank you that the Thessalonians were of great encouragement to the Apostle Paul. To the point that it gave him life. Father, I pray for each one of us that we would not only see the heart of our pastors, that we would seek to love them, to encourage them, to be a joy to them, to pray for them. And likewise, Lord, we lift up Anthony to you, that you would encourage his heart not only by this message, Lord, but you would encourage him by the faith of his people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.